Okay, we're at about 4.35, uh, and I see we have a good number of folks online joining us now at this point, and a good crew in the auditorium. Hello, everybody assembled today. Um, my name is Bryn Hatton. I teach art history here at Colgate, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you our two speakers for the day. Uh, Tomie Arai is a celebrated public artist, community organizer, printmaker, installation artist, and activist whose work has been exhibited and commissioned nationally by an impressive list of institutions and organizations, uh, including Creative Time, the New York City Board of Education, the Library of Congress, the Bronx Museum of the Arts, the Williams College Museum of Art, MoMA, and the Whitney. Um, and also, alongside these prestigious associations, of course, Tommy Tommy is most, I think, visible and well known for a variety of different kinds of projects that bring art directly to the community uh, and that use social interaction as a medium for both production and investigation. Uh, Tomier's work often initiates and importantly, very importantly, sustains, not just starts, but keeps going, uh, conversations between artists and people who do not consider themselves to be artists or who do not um, necessarily perceive of themselves to be operating in this so-called art world, right? So though she is herself a very powerful and known figure within said art world, uh, so much of the strength of her work is that she uses expansive and abundant possibilities that are offered in what an art practice, you know, could be, uh, and uses those possibilities for all of its capacities, right? Puts it in unique um, kinds of connective, um, agitating positions, and she and her work become processors of new kinds of uh, political and social imagination. So. As for recent projects, which I'm sure we'll hear um, a lot more about today, uh, in 2015, Tony founded the Chinatown Art Brigade, um, a cultural production hub in Chinatown and the Lower East Side neighborhoods in New York City. And the Chinatown Art Brigade hosted, among other things, uh, eight weeks of storytelling, oral histories, some placekeeping anti-displacement walking tours, photography, mapping, and drawing events. Uh, the brigade also notably collaborated with the projection artist, The Illuminator, uh, and they produced a series of large scale outdoor mobile projections that addressed themes of gentrification, displacement, and community resilience in the neighborhoods. Um, and this was largely also in response to these accelerated incursions that had been happening um, in both historic Asian American neighborhoods in Manhattan um, by specifically luxury condo developments and by art galleries. And her, her activist background dates back, you know, before this project, obviously, to the Essential Basement Workshop. This was the first Asian American organization of resistance art that was founded in 1970. And as well as her involvement in the 1980s mural movement and her pivotal role in Godzilla, which was an intergenerational and interdisciplinary collective of Asian American artists and art professionals that was active in New York for well over a decade. And in conversation today with Tomie Arai is Josh McPhee. And Josh has been the force behind one of the most uh, impressive and successful arts lecture series in our department's history, I think I'm happy to say. Um, and in the past two years, he's worked in his capacity as uh, the Christian A. Johnson artist in residence at Colgate. Um, he's best known and is now beloved to us, uh, you know, among his many other accolades that I could spend time on. Uh, but I won't, I want to instead point the focus and kind of move the energy across the hall directly to Josh's, uh, Josh's current exhibition that's up in the Clifford Gallery titled Graphic Liberation. And this exhibition, if you've not been yet, is uh, one of the results of a couple of years almost of dedicated practice, but also a number of recent collaborations with Colgate uh, students, with faculty, with staff, and with various creators of political graphics and other experts in the field. 
um, which aim to deeply and directly explore the role of societal and cultural movements on the production, use, and impact of political graphics. So we will have opportunity after um, Tomie and Josh's conversation today to ask questions and to uh, move into a dialogue with them. So please know that that's, that's available whether you're here in the auditorium or on Zoom. I'll be back here looking for questions on the Zoom chat in, uh, in a few minutes. And um, otherwise, we are ready to hear from Josh and Tomie. So please, let's warmly welcome them. Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to this is the sixth in the series of uh, graphic liberation conversations. Um, thanks to Colgate and everyone in the art and art history department who've been so uh, amazing during this this um, now going on year long process, um, helping me put together these discussions and facilitating all of the tech and then doing all of the work to help put together this exhibition that's up uh, in the Clifford Gallery now at Colgate. Um, for any of you that are students or are in the area, I encourage you to go check it out. Um, we basically turned a good chunk of the gallery into a little print shop so that anyone can go and make uh, posters and agitprop to support um, any of the sort of issues or causes that you think are important uh, in the world. Um, so this is... Um, Six, we're gonna try to do a couple more of these next semester. The The people that are uh, that I'm gonna have discussions with aren't finalized. I know at least one of them is gonna be with a woman named Judy Seidman, who is part of the Medu Arts Ensemble, which was a group of South Africans in exile in Botswana in the 1970s and early 1980s, um, doing anti-apartheid uh, and liberation artwork across all spectrums. So they had a political graphics wing, but they also did music um, and theater, poetry, um, photography. They had all these different um, groupings and they, they played a key pivotal kind of cultural role in the struggle against apartheid in Southern Africa. So I'm looking forward to that discussion and I encourage you to stay tuned um, for details about that next semester. But tonight, um, I'm really, really excited to be talking to uh, Tomie, Tomie Arai um, uh, from, um, I think, I believe, talking to us from Chinatown uh, in New York City. No, <laughs> um, I, I am. I'm. I'm uh, calling in from Brooklyn, uh, also Lenape Canarse land, um, and. Um, we're gonna sort of jump into this this um, discussion with a, a handful of images. The way that we've done this um, all the other times, where we're, we're going to show a, a set of slides um, and talk about them briefly to sort of give us a visual grounding, and then we're going to jump back into just being these talking heads to have a conversation about some of the ideas that come out of um, Tomie's work from uh, these images and in our previous uh, discussions and engagement. So let me sort of share the screen here. And uh, let's jump right in. Yeah. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, I have to say, it's really an honor to be part of this amazing lineup of artists that you've brought to this series. Um, thanks so much to you and Colgate for bringing me here. Uh, calling in from my small apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, uh, but I'm there in spirit in Chinatown as well. Um, so, uh, okay, you know, I uh, this was quite a challenge. Josh asked me to land on five images to talk about, and I decided to uh, to uh, share uh, some work that I'd done with. Um, I guess in collaboration, you can say with organizations that I both loved and respected and in some small part had a role in helping to build um, because I feel like uh, that's the work that I find I always like to talk about and seem to value the most. Um, but I'm beginning with uh, two images, two posters that were 
um, uh, based on images that I created for the basement workshop. Um, the image on the left uh, is a poster I designed um, almost 50 years ago um, at uh, basement, which was at that time just a loose collective of individuals that uh, eventually developed into the first Asian American Cultural Center in New York. Uh, it's, it was um, kind of an incubator and hub for hundreds of Asian American artists and writers and poets, um, dancers, performers over the 16 years that it was in existence. Um, and it was actually more than a cultural center. So I, I listed um, the four programs that Basement was, um, uh, had developed. And um, this, these images actually came out of um, a number of different poster and graphics projects I'd done with Basement over the years. And um, I had the chance to look or listen to the conversation with Emily Douglas that Josh conducted. Uh, and it was interesting that, um, and I would love to talk a little bit more about this later, because uh, we, Emery and I had been in conversation in 2019, right before the pandemic. Um, but we both came out of a, a sort of graphics background and had each done work for magazines and newspapers um, before we became involved with organizations so that sort of high contrast black and white drawing um, sensibility is something that, you know, I, I feel like I shared with, with Emery um, when I first saw his work. Um, the, the image on the right uh, is from a poster that um, advertised the exhibition Serve the People that was curated by Ryan Wong for Interference Archive. Um, not too long ago, 2013, which was um, a way to chart the Asian American movement through uh, art and culture. And I um, was very uh, pleased that he uh, went as far back as basement to find this image, uh, which was uh, actually about self-determination and um, the women's movement uh, to, to um, be the, the face of the exhibition. Uh, Laundryman's Daughter was actually the first silkscreen print that I had ever done. Um, I'd done a lot of silkscreen posters, but um, I hadn't really ever done an edition of prints before I did this one. And um, it was for a uh, um, project, an oral history project that I conducted with the Museum of Chinese in the Americas in 1989. Um, that was the, um, I was the first artist in residence at the museum and not, I don't think they knew what to do with me, but um, they opened their archives. They had a really beautiful collection of oral histories and historic photographs and donations of artifacts from the community. And um, I was able to, uh, to sort of walk my way through them. But one of the things that I was really taken with was the oral histories that they had collected. And um, this was uh, the first print that was actually based on an oral history. And it's been a practice that I've used uh, ever since for the, the next 40 years. I've, I've based um, so much of my work on the collected stories that I've uh, heard and um, I've been honored to have received from, from different people and different communities that I've worked with uh, across the country. Um, it was also my first, um, I guess, uh, introduction to what I now understand is a dialogic process of collecting um, experiences and histories um, that really distinguished, it, distinguished the Chinese um, history project, which is now the Museum of Chinese in America from all the other museums in the city. Uh, uh, Jack Chen, who was the founder, introduced me to the idea of uh, 
co-authoring and co-curating stories uh, from people who had actually experienced these histories. Um, and uh, that was the beginning for me of really uh, relying on um, historical uh, accounts, uh, archives, photographs, and um, the shared experiences of people that I met for my work. Uh, I wanted to share this silkscreen print because um, uh, it's, a, it's a print called Return that was commissioned by the Arizona um, Historical Society in 1998 um, to uh, give as a gift to the uh, Native American tribes in Arizona from the Japanese American community at the 50th anniversary of the closing of the internment camps in World War II. Um, during the war, the government built two Japanese uh, internment or concentration camps on Indian reservations in Arizona without their consent. Uh, one of them was called Gila River and the other was called Poston. And um, uh, 50 years later, um, the, it was the occasion for uh, the Japanese community to come together with the Native American community and talk about that experience. Um, at the time, it was illegal for Native Americans and Japanese to even speak to each other. So uh, clearly there was a lot of unresolved <laughs> um, issues that um, were left open. And it wasn't until uh, this conference and this anniversary, uh, the conference was called Transforming Barbed Wire, that um, people came forward and really uh, talked about uh, their experiences um, on both sides of, of the barbed wire. Um, my, uh, my grandparents were interned at um, uh, Tule Lake and uh, later at Topaz, but um, you know, the, clearly the experiences of the uh, Japanese in, in Hila River and in Poston were, were very similar. Um, I think that as uh, somebody who is part of a co cultural collective that is centering uh, a fight against gentrification in New York Chinatown, and we're just beginning to understand what, what it means to be um, settlers, you know, on, on um, uh, ancestral, the ancestral land of the Lenape and um, how we need to acknowledge that as immigrants, you know, we are part of the settler colonialism that um, has disrupted and uh, destroyed so much of uh, Native culture in our country. And um, I'm only beginning to be aware of the overlapping sort of histories of Asians in America and, and Indigenous people. My grandparents were both on both sides. Uh, came from Japan to work on the sugar plantations in Hawaii, which were responsible for displacing and destroying so much of indigenous culture on the islands. And um, so uh, I felt like um, this was a, a story that I, I just really wanted to share as part of um, the work that I'm doing and, and really continuing to, to learn more about. Uh, this uh, last piece is um, a poster that I created during COVID um, for an organization called the Wing on Woe Project. And um, for those of you who don't live in New York City, Wing on Woe is uh, an actual store in Chinatown. Uh, it's one of the oldest porcelain stores in the U.S. And it's um, now the home of a cultural center. Um, in fact, you know, uh, these, these um, small uh, mom and pop stores um, 
in communities like Chinatown, I think have always been considered cultural centers and, and places where people have congregated um, for various reasons. But um, Wing on Wo is now a very dynamic and vibrant um, women, trans and queer led cultural center in, in Chinatown. And um, during COVID, so many uh, businesses uh, were so severely impacted by the pandemic. Um, almost immediately, people stopped going to Chinatown because they were afraid of getting uh, the China virus. And um, uh, you know, there's now facing uh, so many foreclosures and evictions because of uh, you know, just the economic precarity brought on by the virus. But um, they decided, Wing Wo decided to create a project called Love Letters to Chinatown. And they invited people to write messages of hope to the community. And they had volunteers take these messages and paste them around the mm. neighborhood. So I created this poster, um, which was actually based on a poem that was etched in the walls of the Angel Island Detention Center almost 100 years ago. Um, and the, the poetry that they discovered on the walls of Angel Island was really what saved the, the detention center from destruction. But um, I was so struck by this poem because it seemed somehow so, um, so relevant, um, even though it was written in, in a, in the cells of a detention center by a Chinese immigrant who had just arrived in San Francisco. Um, and I'll just read the last four lines, um, which is translated clearly from the Chinese. Uh, With a weak country, we must all join together in urgent effort. It depends on all of us together to pull back the wild wave. Um, and I think that's the last slide, right? Yep. Okay. So, I mean, it's so profoundly um, clear just looking at that handful of images that the, the heart of so much of your work is about different forms of sto storytelling. Um, and so I, I want to set I want to set a marker for that because um, I want to talk about that. But before that, I want to sort of go back to the beginning a little bit. Um, because as far as I understand it, you went to art school, correct? Um, I did go to art school. I didn't finish art school. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, because I'm, I'm interested in this, this um, especially, you know, so many of the people who are in the auditorium there and are tuned in are, are art students. Um, how did you make that leap from art school to embedding yourself in a community organization um, that was both about cultural production, but was also clearly a political center as well, and was sort of at the crossroads of a lot of different um, campaigns and social justice issues and, and work around healthcare and, and tenants' rights and, and all these other kind of issues in Chinatown in the early 1970s? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I find that a little ironic, that question, because I um, actually wasn't able to finish school because I uh, was a single parent uh, and um, really had to find a way to make a living. Um, and you know, in, in hindsight, you know, I'm certainly a lot older. Uh, I look back at the the rather stupid choices that I've made in my life, and how um, sometimes you know, without knowing it, you know, those choices determine uh, everything that you plan you do from that moment on. You know, and someone once said, you know, we are all um, uh, the we all are at, at this moment, uh, every, all, every choice that we've made, you know, we are exactly where we should be. <laughs> but um, not having been able to finish college or go to school um, and having to work. And then also 
finding myself in sort of desperate situations where um, I didn't really know what my future was going to be really made me think a lot about um, what it means to survive, what, what people in my situation need to do in order to survive. And I think I've always had that empathy for people who are, um, you know, disenfranchised, who, um, you know, and, and who, you know, without an education, you know, it, it's absolutely true that you are an underclass, you know, and you're treated um, really, uh, you know, you're devalued. Um, so uh, I think that I, I had to find my way through that. And one of the books that I'm really so uh, thrilled about is this book I just read by Saidiya Hartman uh, called Way Wayward Lives. It's um, really about um, stories from the radical archives. And um, one of the things she talks about is these, these women who um, really uh, were so marginalized, so powerless, and yet they, they found a way through that by guessing at the world. And um, I just love that phrase, uh, guessing at the world and seizing chance. And I, I feel like that really was my, my story, you know, that I, I actually was very fortunate to find myself in places where people were, um, especially artists, were so generous. Um, I learned everything about art from other artists, essentially, and, and from working uh, on the spot, you know, just learning as I was going. Um, and I remember I, I just always wanted to be an artist, but nobody in my family was an artist. I really didn't know how to be one. You know, I, I'd go to the museum, I wouldn't see anybody like me. You know, I'm sure that's a familiar story. Um, uh, a common experience for a lot of people. So um, I just always felt like uh, I was among those people who had to figure it out and, uh, you know, build your own, build the places you want it to be in. And uh, so my first job was actually painting murals. Um, my first paid job as an artist and, um, I learned how to paint mural by just going up on the scaffolding and standing next to somebody who showed me how to do it. Um, but, you know, secretly, it was always something I wanted to do. I mean, I just always, from the very beginning, wanted to make people's art. You know, I just, um, I remember when I was um, in high school and I was able to go to the high school of music and art, uh, which now is LaGuardia High School. So um, I think from a very early age, I knew I wanted to be an artist. I just had to figure out a way to be that, be, be that person. Um, but to answer your question, um, I think that uh, the 60s and the 70s were really responsible for sort of shaping my worldview. Um, you know, I can't, really say that um, it was just one thing, um, but, you know, a combination of world events and then um, making choices about where I, where I felt I fit in. And, um, you know, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, um, the uh, just all the sort of militant um, models that were out there in, in, in different communities, really trying to build um, new and, and sort of in, in powerful institutions for those areas, you know, were things that, that really influenced me and made me want to follow in those footsteps. It, it, <clears throat> we had had a conversation before, I think, I mean, what I think what during the serve the people exhibition um, in which I mean what what I think what was so impactful about that project that Ryan Wong did for me was that 
so many people that are my generation and younger take for granted that the sort of Asian American identity um, as if that's some sort of fixed thing that has always existed. And that show really opened up that no one thought about or use that term until the 1970s and that it came out of the political work that um, people like yourself were doing. And uh, like you said, you know, with it, it was the middle of a US war of aggression against Vietnam, the cultural revolution had just happened in China. And you had said that you were drawing from the visual kind of landscape of some of these places and struggles because they were the only images that you saw of people that look like you. Can you sort of speak about that kind of, um, what it felt like to be at that moment of realization and of like really the beginning of creating a visual representation of what, what, what Asian America looks like? Yeah, I know there was recently an article in the New York Times by uh, Jay Kang questioning the term Asian American. Um, and I think that's part of the conversation now, whether it's useful to use a term like that when our communities are really so diverse and um, it really uh, doesn't describe accurately um, just the, all the different uh, so sort of trajectories that brought people from Asia here to this place. But um, I think that uh, the term was so embraced because um, it was a way to subvert this notion that we were all the same and um, that, you know, somehow Asians made up this mon monolithic race. Um, you know, people couldn't tell the difference between Vietnamese, Japanese, Chinese, or Korean. And, and um, rather than uh, uh, talk about how our differences, you know, we embraced our common, common experiences. And, um, you know, it was a way to, uh, to just proclaim that we were, um, we were proud of who we were in, in all our shared you know, um, experiences and histories. And, um, you know, it was a way to recognize that, uh, that we could um, we could turn what seemed like a, a negative stereotype into something much more powerful if we understood the power in numbers. Um, and I, you know, I think back in those days we talked uh, extensively about uh, whether or not there was an Asian American culture and you know what that looked like and uh, you know what how that. How, how you could identify that, you know, and, and then we always looked at, you know, the black community and say, well, you know, they have jazz, you know, and do we have anything like that in our culture and our, our uh, common experiences here in America, um, you know, what, what, what defines us? And, um, you know, I don't think that's ever been a question that's been resolved. Um, I know for me, um, I, I think that everything changed uh, during 9-11, uh, at the point of 9-11, when I realized, you know, that, that America was not the center of the universe. You know, and somehow, you know, we had chosen to define ourselves by our American experiences, but there was a whole world out there you know, that we were not um, acknowledging, you know, as part of that experience. Um, but I do feel like, uh, you know, the war and uh, that sort of relentless um, media coverage of all the atrocities in Vietnam um, and at the same time, you know, the, the recognition that the, the national liberation struggles of other countries, including Vietnam and, and um, Cuba and Nicaragua and Chile and um, were uh, uh, something to aspire to. You know, I think that's that's where I think many of us got our inspiration.
so maybe let's let's use that to jump back into this th this idea of like wanting to to do murals that you always wanted to do people's art and you work for city arts which i think um you know at the time was one of the you know really big kind of innovative mural programs in the country um can you talk a little bit about like city arts and your, your role doing murals and the, the sort of um lessons learned in that in, in terms of relating to like you're you're making giant images on other people's in other people's communities um how does that work what does that look like what are the ethics of that yeah that's a good question you know i i think that um the reason why to be perfectly honest you know the reason why i was so um excited about murals was um and the idea that this this notion of what it means to make people's art was because I was looking through at the world through a Marxist lens. I mean, I was um, uh, very uh, excited, you know, about the the kinds of social experiments that I was seeing around the world and um, how people were. Um, we're coming together to build a people's culture and you know, seeing the posters, for example, from Cuba and Osval and um, uh, the murals coming out of Nicaragua, you know, to me was, was you know, so, so exciting. But there was a, you know, a murals movement in the US um, that many people say has its roots in Chicago with Bill Walker and um, the African-American muralists, um, Cabrini Green Housing Project, um, and um, the, the Chicano muralists in LA, you know, who, they were all doing murals anyway. Um, so um, we kept hearing about all these different public art projects. And uh, the first, first mural I think I ever worked on uh, was a mural that I um, I saw as I was walking down the street in Chinatown and, and there was someone on the scaffolding who called down to me. Um, I don't know how they recognized who I was, but they, you know, they asked me to come up and, and they gave me a brush. And um, that was actually the way that those projects were structured, you know, is to grab participants off the street and um, I was, you know, just completely um, sold at that point. You know, and I thought it was a great, a great idea. And uh, you know, City Arts at that time had a slogan. It was out of the gallery and into the streets. And, um, and they were um, really talking about working with local artists and community residents to create art not just you know, take the designs of artists and put them on walls, but actually from beginning to end, from planning and design to painting, um, create works of art for their neighborhoods. And you know, back in those days, a neighborhood was a block. You know, it, was, it was a neighborhood, you could define it block by block. Um, so if you were someone who lived in Chinatown, that was your neighborhood, but you didn't go, you know, it's Little Italy <laughs> or, you know, the Lower East Side was a neighborhood that had very different, um, uh, just uh, everything was different from a neighborhood in Brooklyn. So, um, you know, it was so important to live and work in the spaces that you made art in. Um, you know, now, you know, when the way we define community is so much broader and you know, there are communities of affinity, it's not really your geographic community that defines you. But um, uh, one of the lessons that I learned was, you know, that you had to spend time in a place to um, really build the kind of trust that you needed 
to go out and, and make art with people. So with both both the sort of poster making and with murals, you know, we've seen in the last, you know, certainly since since the 90s in the last 30 years, um, not that it was happening before too, but um, one, just like massive transformations in the way that we engage with shared space, um, public space, like this idea of what your neighborhood is, I think, you, as you sort of were hinting at, is really, for a lot of people, has evolved and changed. Um, and then also, these cultural forms have been very rapidly picked up by advertisers um, and become um, dominant ways that things are sold back to us at this point. Like, do you, what do you see as the, do you think that there's still a lot of potential in these forms? Um, or do we need to sort of come up with new ways of engaging um, with communities and, 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 uh, place keeping as as you've said in the in the Chinatown Art Brigade. Yeah, you know, I, I, I heard that you could get an MFA in community art now. Um, <laughs> so, you know, certainly institutionalized. Um, yeah. I, um, you know, well, art is a business and uh, of course, you know, art, all art eventually gets commodified um, that's how they keep the art world going. Uh, so I, I feel like I'm kind of deeply cynical about um, the ways in which um, some of our radical movements, you know, have been, uh, I guess, uh, branded and um, have, I think, um, served began began to serve other purposes but um i i'm really um very encouraged by technology by the way that um the internet can reach so many people and impact so many people at the same time i i do feel like we need to uh we really need to reimagine what public spaces in our our cities and and across the country can look like, you know, and then, you know, it's not um, surprising to me that during uh, the pandemic and during the Black Lives Matter global protests that monuments, you know, became a target uh, for so many people as you know, symbols of power that need to be replaced and removed and. Um, I think that, you know, there are now, um, I happen to have been fortunate to have been a fellow at Monument Lab uh, during 2020. So um, the, the symbolism of, of monuments and the question of what will replace these, um, these uh, monuments and memorials to white supremacy uh, something that you know we we talked about um, as a cohort during that time, um, but I but I feel like um, just replacing statues of Confederate soldiers with other statues is really not um, the answer. You know, I, I think we have to really look at the way that history has been. Um, uh, History has been portrayed how it, how it's been, how so much of our histories have been suppressed or forgotten, and, and think about these spaces in, in a more um, expansive way as, as sites of learning or um, you know, ways that we can create memorials that aren't necessarily um, conceived as, as, as permanent you know, works of art, monumental works of art um, or art for that matter uh, but um, I'm uh, you know I, I feel like people are everywhere you know looking for ways to um, create new models 
for um, making work, uh, communicating, um, bringing people together through art and culture. And um, I find, you know, that every time I turn around, somebody's doing something really interesting and exciting. And, uh, you know, that's, that's very uplifting. I mean, you've been, I feel like you've been at the forefront of, of some of this, of um, putting up public work that doesn't tell a monumental story, but is actually polyvocal and captures and engages with and sort of re weaves back and forth in conversation with lots and lots of people in the place where the work exists. And you've brought in the, the screen printing and some, you know, so much of what are the early work and, and, and done these, these larger works. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the process of that and what you're always sort of what not what, what you're trying to to sort of get at and accomplish and whether you feel like the the work is doing that and the directions that you would like to continue to take it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I so appreciate these questions about making things because because um, I never get to talk about that. I always only get asked about the subject matter or the content. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I, it, was, it was really easy for me to make a transition from doing murals, which, you know, are large scale works of art that actually have to be done collectively because um, there's, there's no way that one person can actually paint a whole mural unless you have tons of time um, and you know the results are always uh, very different but um, making the transition from a collective process of uh, working collaboratively thinking collaboratively and and in many ways um, uh, really questioning like um, who the work is for, how it gets made, who gets to take the credit for it, um, what is the power dynamic, you know, within a group, all of those things that happen in in uh, the course of doing something with other people, making that transition to making prints, really seems like going from public to personal spaces. Like, and, and in ways, in many ways, I feel like printmaking is a studio practice. Um, it's certainly taught that way. Um, but um, one of the things that I was drawn to about printmaking was that it was um, democratic, you know, that, that you could create multiples of an image and, um, and I could share them. I could give them away. You know, I, I didn't see the preciousness, you know, of a one-off piece, you know, I, I could, um, take this image and I could um, show people how to make art that could be shared. So um, I felt that printmaking actually for me was always a public, maybe social practice. And um, it was uh, reciprocal, there was, it was, there was reciprocity in it. I guess that's what I am trying to say, you know, that I could, I could work with somebody and sometimes you know in a shop printmaking is a communal or collective space and and in the course of working we could give each other our work or we could um, think about how we could share skills or we could um, uh, com come together to create maybe multiple stories. I have participated in portfolio projects where, which I love, you know, where every artist gets a print and, and then all the portfolios get distributed to libraries. And, but, um, you know, I, I really feel like um, I've, you know, learned that it's the process really that has always engaged me. It's that point where you You, you're leading always with a question and then somehow you come together with someone else to answer it. But um, 
I, I think that there is, you know, there's so much oral history going on now, especially, you know, one of the things that I was able to do during COVID was to uh, um, help develop a archive of oral histories and artifacts um, from Asian Pacific Americans who were impacted by COVID and um, not just the pandemic, but also um, how they were um, uh, surviving the whole year and, and their thoughts about the Black Lives Matter global protests and how they were responding to anti-Asian violence. And um, I think that uh, you know, a lot of people are starting to look at this past year and you know, certainly we've all experienced a huge amount of trauma individually. I think all of us have had to um, try to sort out what happened. And um, for some of us, you know, it was a terrible, terrible year, you know, and, and um, there are lots of people who are trying to collect stories of trauma, essentially. And so the idea of um, taking these stories and extracting, you know, some meaning from them um, is, is a, you know, it's an ethical question, really. So, uh, you know, I feel like um, what, you know, what would the point of doing that be? And also how can, how can we proceed to archive this moment, you know, with as much respect and care as we can. So um, it isn't an extractive process. And so that is another way of looking at process too, like how we can change the ways that we've, um, art, as artists, for example, uh, work with people and, and build more care into it. Uh, so that, um, you know, moving forward, we're actually building different models for, for making work. I don't it's, know if I answered your question, because I can't remember it. No, so. no. <laughs> um, you answered, you answered a, a, a good chunk of it. Uh, it's, it's 525. I don't know, Bryn, if you want to see if should we jump into questions or should, should we keep talking for another five minutes? Yeah, if, um, if this feels like a good transition moment, we can certainly open it to the floor here. Um, we have one question in the, in the audience and then I'll see if anyone would like to pose any questions in the chat. So yeah, would you mind just passing the mic down? Uh, hello, sorry. Uh, so just like, directly relating to what you were just talking about. Uh, like, what is your process for turning these archives or really any historical resources that you have access to like into, into your artwork? Wow. That's a very good question. Um, well, you know, I, I am a printmaker and um, so I've, um, well, I'll, I'll share this with you and then you could tell me if it makes any sense at all. Um, very early on, I got very tired of doing editions. Um, I just felt like, you know, printmaking is not painting. No, it's, it's very processed labor intensive and, and um, craft based in many ways. Um, is there no surprises, you know, it's all pre-production and then um, the trick is that you keep, you can make the same image over and over again, at exactly as you had conceived it. And so I decided that, um, first of all, I didn't think I was a very good printmaker. So um, I didn't want to get stuck, you know, on, on registration and, and also, you know, thinking about selling the work, which was not really that interesting to me. I, I just really wanted to um, tell a story with, with the process. So I um, decided to use silkscreen as a drawing tool. And um, 
said a lot of the public projects that I've done lately, which include banners and murals, have to do with taking the screen and moving it across the surface um, randomly in some ways. Okay, so mm. that the images overlap because I, I wanted to be able to tell stories in a different way, not, um, not in the way that you would read uh, something from left to right, for example, but more in the way that an archeologist would find information by digging from front to back or from back to front. Um, so um, I started collecting a lot of images um, and that's something that I do uh, now with every um, the different community that I work with, um, whether it's um, uh, historical uh, imagery that I find uh, that tells me something about the actual place that I'm in or um, images that are shared with me, with people that I speak to or um, just photographs that I take of uh, a location. And I try to create um, a narrative from, from these images that um, uh, don't necessarily um, have a beginning, middle and end as a story, but just are interconnected. So that's what I'm aiming for is to create some kind of um, vocabulary, I guess, with, with these images that are um, a language that I can use. And so, um, for instance, if I go to Chinatown and I am asked to do a print about Chinatown, I might start with um, research. You know, a lot of it is just talking to people, meeting people, going to um, places that people recommend that I seek out. It could be even, you know, if there is a cultural center there. Um, trying to partner, that's also really important. I forgot to mention that. Partner with an organization that's in the community um, that can help me um, it's it, a, a, an organization that uh, can connect me to other people and, um, and then uh, sort of build a set of images and um, I guess uh, a narrative that can emerge from that experience. <laughs> Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, we have one back there. Um, so my question is, did you and your co-founders create the Chinatown Art Brigade with one specific goal in mind? And if so, what was that goal? And if not, where do you see the collective going in the future? Thanks for that question. Um, naturally, this, uh, my experience with the brigade is, is sort of an example of something that starts as a project and then over time becomes an organization and um, without our knowing it <laughs> almost, you know, and um, I feel like we began with the idea, we were invited to do a mural with a community group on the Lower East Side called the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence. And they wanted us to do a mural with their tenants. They have a, a program called the Chinatown Tenants Union that is, uh, helps fight evictions and um, is fighting for affordable housing in the area. But we, um, actually we didn't want to do a mural because um, we, I knew you know, that the bureaucracy of getting a space to do a mural in New York is is not worth you know the time and effort, um, and uh, one of the members really uh, thought that doing a light projection instead would be a uh, you know a lot more fun, and would also be a way that we could involve the tenants in creating messages. 
that we could share around the community. So we partnered with, we also partnered with the Illuminator who um, provided the projector and the technical um, expertise and personnel. And uh, we began to do light projections in Chinatown. But um, it actually evolved as a, um, uh, as a project that spans several, several months. And we are now in the fifth year of this project. Uh, and we are still building the kind of trust we need between the tenants and ourselves and, and to, to really get them to believe, you know, that arts and culture are one way that they can advance, you know, their, their campaigns against, um, you know, uh, for housing rights. Um, but uh, very early on, you know, we realized that um, as artists, we were complicit, you know, in a lot of the displacement and gentrification that we were seeing in the neighborhood because there were all, already over a hundred galleries in Chinatown, each gallery displacing a small business that might have served the community. So um, I think because we were artists and because we understood um, that this was a moment where we could talk to other artists about the situation, we took that on as, as, um, as something that we wanted to, uh, to focus on. But, you know, displacement and gentrification are not, or never standalone issues. I mean, they, when you talk about displacement, you're also talking about the environmental impact of displacement and, and the climate change that occurs or the you know, health issues that come from terrible housing or the unemployment, you know, that, that is responsible for so many people losing their homes and on and on. So I feel like it was something that we could talk about concretely that um, really seemed to resonate with that area because they were trying to make Chinatown the next arts district in New York. Um, you know, when the Whitney moved to Chelsea, it displaced dozens of galleries that needed to find other spaces. And so they all gravitated to Chinatown as, you know, as sort of cheap real estate. Um, so uh, at that time, you know, it really did feel like an issue that we could connect to what was going on overall that was transforming the neighborhood. Um, but it was really, you know, not, just the artists and galleries, you know, it was the developers and the ways in which they were using art and culture um, to make places more attractive or desirable for people to invest in that we were pushing back against. Um, and to this day, you know, I think um, we're just really one of many uh, Asian American collectives that are in formation now. I mean, that's really encouraging to see. Um, and uh, I think that um, we're trying to work uh, in coalition with as many groups as possible. Um, I personally don't think that organizations have to live forever. Um, and that they serve a need and sometimes, you know, they're the, that moment is over and people move on, but you know we're still hanging on. Um, we've been partnering with Decolonize This Place uh, over a number of issues to challenge uh, a lot of the cultural institutions in New York and to look more closely at um, their boards of directors and um, the kinds of ways in which they have also used art to art wash some of the bad money that supports them. Did that answer your question or did you have anything else? It was great to get to hear more about the Art Brigade because we sort of ran out of time in the actual conversation. So oh. I really appreciate that question as well. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, I, I feel like um, as, as one of the uh, senior <laughs> members of the brigade, I have to assure you that everybody else is a whole lot younger than me. <laughs> um, I, I've come to realize that, um, you know, the, the, the question isn't about making political art, you know, <laughs> it's not about producing political posters or, or making murals, it's about what you decide to do as, as a citizen, as a person living in this world to enact some change. It's about artists, artists becoming organizers and artists becoming agents of change. Um, I don't necessarily think that art can change the world, but I, you know, I think that we need people to um, imagine <laughs> what the world could be and that artists are so good at that, you know, we're, we're, that's what we do. We, we're always thinking about what's next and what that can look like. And so I feel like there is a role for artists in, in, um, in the movement, um, but you don't always have to think about it being uh, about how what kind of art you make, you know, or what kind of art you do. You could be the most political person and, and, and do still life. You know, I, I frankly um, think that there's room for all kinds of art in the world, um, but it's really um, how you see yourself in the world that, that really makes the difference. Very inspiring place to to uh, leave us. Unless anyone has any other questions, either online or or here today. Okay. Well, Josh, Tony, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's a really wonderful conversation, and uh, yeah, we hope you all will join us for the next iteration of the Art and Art History Lecture Series. And you can stay tuned for our announcements about that. But thank you again to our guests today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Go print some stuff in the gallery across the hall. <laughs>